Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I hope uh, and trust that you had a great week this week celebrating the freedom that we have here in America and celebrating, uh, you know, all the, among those freedoms, celebrating the opportunity we have to, to come and worship together. And, and those times are good times. We get together with, with friends and family and we get time off work and, and we enjoy those times. And in those times, it's easy for us to remember God. Thank you, God, for blessing me. I am blessed. Thank you for the rain or for the sun or, or those type of things. It's easy. But what about... When things go bad, where is God? We read about in the news uh, shootings at schools. We read about uh, earthquakes and tsunamis that, that kill thousands. We read about plane crashes and all of these type of things that, that are devastating. We read about we read about just last week about wildfires in Arizona that were out of control, killing firemen as they work to protect the lives of others. I saw one a picture of one fireman. I'm sure many of you saw that uh, a young man had four children and is now they're left without a dad. When things go bad, where is God? Oftentimes we, we think of these type of cat- catastrophes and when we think of these type of things and we, when we lose hope, we, we lose our, our perspective, we lose our way, we begin to feel like God is missing. God is, is somehow absent. God is busy doing other things or, or even worse, that God doesn't care at all. One of my favorite movies, I, I don't know if any of you have seen it, many of you probably have, is it, Shawshank Redemption. And if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to watch it. Watch the TV edit, it's a little bit better. Um, but one of the, the great lines from that movie is, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. And I believe that's true not only in, in movies or, or in, in life, but in, in terms of our spirituality, it's important that we have hope. Hope is a wonderful thing. And hope is easy to have when things are going good for us. But what about when things go bad? What happens to us when our hope wavers, when we're struggling financially, when we're struggling with our, our job situation, when we're struggling in relationships, when we're struggling with life in general, what happens then? Is there such a thing that, uh, that as, as hope that lasts forever? Is there such a thing as, as hope that endures, as, as a hope that's unbreakable during those tough times? We know that we're called to trust God. We believe that God is a good God. We, we, we know that, that God is there for us. But, but, but is it possible to always count on Him, to always trust Him, what about trusting in God when things go terribly wrong? That's oftentimes easier said than done. If you're stuck in a hopeless situation right now, some of you are. If you're stuck in this hopeless situation, maybe many of you are thinking to yourself, where is God? Where is God when I'm calling out to Him? Where is God when I'm looking for Him? Where is God when I need Him? It was a little bit of a, a com- example of this that's a comedic example. I think um, in First Kings, Elijah was a prophet and Elijah was challenging the prophets of Baal. And he called on them to, to set out this, this offering on the altar. And he said, you pray to Baal and I'll pray to God and we'll see which God is real, which God consumes this offering. And, and as they're praying and they're, they're going on and it's taking forever and nothing's happening and they're they're cutting themselves and their God is not listening. And in 1 Kings 18, 27, Elijah says, that, or it says this, And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep. 
and he must be awakened. And that's kind of funny as we think about the prophets, prophets of Baal standing there and, and longing for God, longing for their God to come and to, to prove himself. And Elijah mocks, laughing, saying, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's relieving himself because he knew their God wasn't real. But how many of us have been in that spot where we're calling on God, where, where we're hoping that God will be there for us? We know that we can trust on God, but yet it seems like he's far away. It seems like he's asleep or, or on a journey or even worse, not listening at all. Where is God during those times? Have you ever felt like God was missing or that He didn't care or too busy? Well, last week we started this series of sermons, Songs of Hope. As we began looking at the Psalms, we're going to be looking at just four of them. There's, there's so many. Uh, it would be impossible for us to, to move through, not impossible, but nearly impossible for us to move through all of them. So we're going to touch on them. And hopefully as time goes on, as years go on, we'll touch on more and more of these as we go through other parts of the Bible as well. But, but, but the Psalms are amazing and wonderful. And there are so many that give us hope. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open them up to Psalm 13, which is what Kathy read uh, just a moment ago. Psalm 13. Last week we looked at, at Psalm 8, which was a, a hope for the insignificant, for those who are, are struggling with who they are, whether they're uh, really, whether they really matter, whether they're significant in life, we looked at that scripture today. We're going to be looking at hope for the hopeless. Psalm 13. Let's begin by reading verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at King David's anxiety here. Verses 1 and 2. Psalm 13. To the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long? Must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? You can hear David's hopelessness coming through. You can hear David's struggle and his, his fight to understand what's going on and, and wonder what's going on. And, and David is so caught up in this idea of God responding. He, he says four times, how long? God, and my guess is that so many of us in here in this room have asked that same question, God, how long? How long is it going to take for you to answer my prayer? How long before you relieve me of this suffering? God, how long? I think David had a problem that many of us have, and it's a problem of expectation versus reality. David expected God to act in a certain way. David expected God that, that when he prayed that God would respond. And David had good reason to think this way because over and over in David's life, God had responded like that. When David had an issue, when David had a concern, when David had a prayer, God was right there. David's life was blessed. And so when, when David got to a point in his life where he had found some struggles, where he, where he encountered some difficulties, where he encountered a, maybe a, a loss of hope, he he wanted to know, God, where are you? How long is it going to take before you respond? Expectations versus reality cause us lots of problems. I imagine many of you have expectations of your children that are unmet. And those unmet expectations uh, lead to difficulty in the house. I imagine many of your husbands are currently in the process of not meeting your expectations, wives. A lot of teachers don't meet our expectations. A lot of ministry leaders are, 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 are paid ministry staff. They don't meet our expectations. And when they don't meet our expectations, we get upset and go somewhere else. Or we get angry and we go to the leaders and we say, how long? How long until they meet my expectation? Well, David was, was suffering from some of this. Some of this expectation versus reality. He was a leader. He had... He had enemies. Anytime you're a leader of anything, you're going to have people who are opposed to you. David was a leader who had enemies all around him. Some commentators believe that at this point in David's life, he was suffering from an illness that was causing him some medical issues. That would be an issue too. We, we can kind of see some of these things that are causing David's problems. But what was worse was that, that 
that, that, than all of these problems was that to David, God seemed like he wasn't there. Or even worse than that, that he didn't care about what was going on. And so all of this caused David to lose hope. It caused him to have a sense of hopelessness. And in this moment, in these first two verses of this song, we can hear David's hope being shattered. His hope broken. David felt like God had abandoned him in his time of need. And when David needed him most, God wasn't there. And like David, most of us have prayed this, God, where are you? Do you see my suffering? Do you see what I'm going through? Are you ignoring me? Or do you even care? But look at verse 3 and 4. This is King David's prayer of help. David writes this, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. And so in David's moment of hopelessness, he turns to God in prayer. And David says, light up my eyes. He's not asking that his eyes, you know, get lights or anything like that or have some kind of laser. He's not asking that. He's saying, lighten up my life. Lessen my burden. Give me some, something to look forward to. Lift my spirits. And even in David's struggles, he knows that God is there. He's willing to listen and to hear. He knows that God can help him. And I wonder, you know, we, we don't know for sure. But I wonder if in this moment, David is thinking, God, if you would just help me to know the end. Help me to know what is going to be gained from this. I can, I can handle the struggle. I can handle this, this moment of pain. If you just let me know the end. I imagine that would be the, the case with all of us. If we knew what our struggles would lead to, if we knew that our struggles would lead to, to benefiting us or our life or someone else, sometimes our struggles would be worth it if we knew the end. Many of us have gone through struggles. And at the end of it, we've, we've, we've said things like, I wouldn't change it. It was hard, but I wouldn't go back because now I know how it worked out. And I think many of us would, would face times of trial, face times of difficulty if we knew that on the other side of things, things would be better. In fact, we do this all the time. Well, we, can you imagine somebody coming at you with a knife saying, I'm going to cut your stomach open? We would never allow that unless it was a surgeon. Because we know a surgeon is going to do that and we know that on the, on the other side of the surgery, though there will be pain and suffering on the other side, our lives are going to be better. Or maybe if your, your foot is, is severely damaged and it's causing problems and, and the doctor says we need to cut off your leg, we know that that's going to cause suffering, going to cause problems, going to cause pain. But if it benefits our life, we can see, we can understand the suffering and the trial and the pain knowing that there's going to be benefits on the other side. And so for many of us, if we could just see what God sees, we, we would understand, we would be okay with the pain and the suffering that we go through. And so David is praying to God here, God, lift my spirits. Lighten my eyes. Lighten my mood. Pick me up. Help me to see. Help me to understand. And look what David goes to in verses 5 and 6. And this is King David's confidence in God. We can see a change here. Verse 5, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. Now, I don't know how long it took David to write this. I don't know what kind of lifespan it, it, it encompassed or where David was thoughts were going as he wrote this song. But it's obvious that at, at some point in David's life, he was in the pit of despair, uh, the pit of utter hopelessness. His hope was, was destroyed. And David came out on the other side and he changed his position saying, I have trusted in your steadfast love. David went from looking at himself, looking at his struggles, his problems, to looking at God. In verses 1 through 4, we, we find uh, the word me or my 11 times. 
in verses 1 through 4, David is looking at his pain, his problems, his struggles. His focus is on himself, what's going on in his life. And in verses 5 and 6, it completely changes. His focus changes from me to thee. His focus changes from, from himself to God. And when he, did, when he did that, his hope changed. David's hope goes from, from being shattered and broken, and now David's hope seems to be that of, un, of an unbreakable hope. A, a hope that, that cannot be broken. A hope that is, that is enduring and everlasting. And David's example is not the only case. One of the, my favorite examples of, of this type of shattered hope, restored, I guess you could call it, is from the prophet Jeremiah. We call Jeremiah the weeping prophet for, for good reason. Jeremiah was a big crybaby. <laughs> but he had good reason to cry. I believe Jeremiah's calling was probably the most uh, difficult calling that, that, is, that God has ever placed in anyone's life. Jeremiah was called to, to, to preach to the southern kingdom and to, to call them to repentance. They had turned from God and they were worshiping all these false idols. And Jeremiah goes to them year after year after year, giving them the words that God has put in his mouth to say. And he calls them from their gods to the God to repent of their sin of, of chasing after these false gods. And you know how many people listen? After 40 years of preaching, you know how many people listened to Jeremiah speak the words of God? Almost zero. There were a couple people who helped him out here and there. But other than that, the rest of the kingdom of Israel turned their back on Jeremiah. So Jeremiah had every right to look at himself and say, why me, God? To kind of wallow in this, this, this pity, to wallow in this sense of hopelessness. In fact, let me read to you a little bit of what Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 20, 14 through 18. He wrote this, Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, a son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? And you can just hear Jeremiah, this weeping prophet, in his utter hopelessness. Can Jeremiah's hopelessness be turned like King David's to a hope that endures forever? Well, something changed in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah wrote the very next book of the Bible, Lamentations. In Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 21 through 24, we read this. Did I, did I put those on the slides? Lamentations, yeah. Lamentations 3, 21. This, again, this is Jeremiah, the same man who had these struggles and pains and sufferings. This same man who said, Cursed be the man who told my dad the good news that I was born. And he says this in 3, 21 through 24. But, I, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. And Jeremiah's, like David's, hope was shattered. He was, in a, he was literally in a pit. Jeremiah was thrown in a pit because the king of Israel, the king of Jerusalem, the king of, of the southern kingdom of Judah said, no, I'm not going to listen to you. Throw him in a pit. And he was literally in a pit suffering. And he said, my life is ruined. My life, it would have been better if I had not been born and Jeremiah's hope seems shattered. And yet he comes to this point where he says, I can trust in the steadfast love of the Lord. His hope went from a broken, shattered pieces of hope to a hope that lasts and endures forever. 
David and Jeremiah both seem to be in hopeless situations. And, and some of you are in a place right now where your life seems hopeless. You're stuck in a job. You're stuck without a job. Your relationships are a mess. You're addicted to something or another. Some of you have a, a situation in life where your life seems unbearably hopeless. Your finances, whatever it is, it seems hopeless. You seem at the end of your rope. Your hope is shattered. Is, there a, is, it, is it possible for us to, to gain an, an enduring hope, an unbreakable hope like David and Jeremiah? How can we be like them and turn our hopelessness into an unbreakable hope? I think looking at, at Jeremiah's verses here in Lamentations, we can come up with a few reasons, a few ways for us to have an unbreakable hope like they had. Number one, know that God loves you and He wants what's best for you. God loves you and He wants what's best for you. And, and Jeremiah wrote in, in the first part of 32, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Remember, God is our Father. And those of you who have children, you understand what this steadfast love is like. And we're imperfect. Can you imagine the perfect love of God the Father always there for you? And maybe God doesn't meet your expectations about doing things the way you think, when you think. But God's love for you never ceases. God has a plan for you. God sees the big picture, things that we could never see. Number two, how can we be like David and Jeremiah and turn our hopelessness into a breakable, unbreakable hope? Know that God will not give up on you. In the second part of 32 or 322, Jeremiah says, his mercies never come to an end. Not only does God's love for you never cease, but His mercies will not come to an end. God will not give up on you. Even though the Israelites that Jeremiah preached to did not listen to Him, they were taken off into captivity. Seventy years later, because God loved them, they returned. God sent Christ to die on the cross for you. Even though... You were an enemy of God and I was an enemy of God. In our sin, we turned our backs on God. We rebelled against Him. God's love for you, His mercies will never cease. God desires for you to be saved. God will not give up on you. Number three, know that God has great faithfulness. In verse 23 there, Jeremiah writes, they are new. Talking about His mercies. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, he wrote to God. So that if we are to turn our hopelessness into an unbreakable, enduring hope, we need to know that God has great faithfulness. He's faithful to us even when we turn our backs on Him. Even when we reject Him. Even when we sin. Even when we point our fingers to God and say, I know better than you. God has great faithfulness. Number four, how can we be like David and Jeremiah and turn our hopelessness into an unbreakable hope? Know that God is enough. Jeremiah concluded in verse 24 there, that little section, by saying, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in Him. God is enough. If you have God, God is enough for you. Maybe your life seems headed down a, a road that, that is headed for utter destruction. God is enough for you. Maybe you think there's no way out. Let me tell you, God is enough. If we have God, we have enough. And that is enough for us to have an unbreakable hope. Though our situations are, are, are stationed in life, our positions may seem terrible. It may seem like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We can have hope in God because God is enough. God proved His love, His faithfulness. He proved His mercy by sending Jesus, His Son, to come to earth as a man, to struggle the way that we struggle, to, to battle temptation, to fight, but without sin. And He sent Him to die a terrible death on a cross. Yet He rose from the dead for you and for me. And because of that, we can have hope. If we want to have an unbreakable hope, we need to take the focus off of us, off of our situation, 
and put our trust in God. Some of you are here this morning and you're not following Jesus. You haven't given yourselves over to God to trust in the Savior. Some of you here are in a situation where you feel utterly hopeless, like there's nothing left for you, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, like you're done. We're going to have a, a time of invitation where you can come forward and we can pray for you. We can teach you or tell you about Jesus and lead you into following Him so that you can be redeemed forever. I'm going to pray and then we're going to uh, sing a song and I ask you to, to come in that time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your steadfast love, as Jeremiah said. Your mercy that's renewed every morning, your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today who lacks hope, whose life looks like it's out of control, like it's headed in the wrong direction, like they're there's no way out. I pray that they turn to You and, and trust in You. Take the focus off their problems, off themselves. And put their focus on You. Trust in You, God. Lord, I pray that You would help us as a church to do that. Help us as a body of believers put our trust in You. Thank You so much for Jesus, for Your love. It's in all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.